back in Mark, Mark chapter 4. I'm going to start today a little bit differently than usual. Talk to you a little bit about numbers. This, this um, parable, the parable of the mustard seed, is a great illustration of God growing his church. A year from, well, it won't even be a year. In uh, May of 19, or 2024, my home church back in Michigan is having a 75th anniversary. And I plan to go to that. That will be the time I take my vacation in May next year. Let me tell you a little bit about my home church. Before I do that, though, I want you to know a little bit about the history of this church. I know a little bit, not much. I do know that at one time it was rather large. In fact, somewhere, I think it's back here somewhere, there's a, there's a photo of a kids in Awana. There's about 60 of them. We should get that out and have, have, you, have you older people look at it because uh, Jeffrey's in it and so is Sabrina and so is Luke and I think maybe Chad is too. I'm not sure. But it's 60 kids lined up here. That's bigger than our, our tennis has ever been since I've been here. So at one time, there was a lot of people here. And I'm not here to compare churches uh, or anything because regardless of how big it is or how small it is, you know what continues to happen? The kingdom of God continues to expand. We're going to have a baptism here in a, a short time. Um, I need to talk about some of those candidates and see if we could do it maybe next week before it gets too cold, right, folks? Let's do it before it gets too cold. Um, and you're going to hear a testimony, some testimonies, but at least one about uh, a person getting saved because of this church in the last couple of years. So you may not see, we may not give all to calls and see people coming to, to, to know Christ, but salvation is taking place. In other words, God's bringing people into his kingdom. We may not always notice it or see it. But we will notice changed lives. Because that's what God really does. He changes lives. And if a life is not changed, you wonder if that person really did enter the kingdom. Because Jesus said in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, except you be born again, born from above, or, or reborn, uh, you cannot see the kingdom of God. God's kingdom continues to march on, even though we may not see a lot of revivals, shall we say. In Acts chapter 1, we read about um, the, the disciples and uh, meeting with others after Jesus, Jesus ascended to heaven. They met in a room and there were 120 there. Now that doesn't seem very large. That seems rather small because look at all the people that Jesus fed at one time. 5,000 here, another 4,000 there. And he spoke to crowds, many crowds. He healed many people. He saw his miracles. But when, when it came right down to it, there were 120 people when the church started. And of course, that, those 120 were waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, which came just a few days later. And then, as, as you know, in uh, Acts chapter 2, Peter preached a sermon on, um, on the resurrection of Christ. And 2,000 people came to Christ. 3,000. Yeah, 3,000. And later, Peter preached another sermon, and then there were 5,000 that were saved. That doesn't happen all the time. It didn't happen all the time. And it happened a lot in the early church, but it didn't happen a lot after that. There have been revivals today. The Welch revivals. There have been some revivals here in America early. There was one, one revival um, sometime re uh, recently. Um, but some people aren't calling it quite a revival. But I want to talk to you about my home church. Ottawa Center Chapel began in 1949. And the reason it's called Ottawa Center is because their first meetings were in a little chapel at Ottawa Center Cemetery, right in the center of Ottawa County, just above the 
major river running through there, Grand River, ran not too far below that where the church was. This cemetery had a little chapel, and that was the first meeting place for that church. Now, my family and I didn't come. We started attending there through the uh, invitation of a neighbor girl who used to babysit some of us, named Norma. And my mom um, actually talked to my, talked my dad into going. Before that, he never went with us to church in our little town of Coopersville. Uh, we, we started going to Ottawa Center Chapel, and it was very interesting. The preacher was always done at 11.30. There, there's a big Sunday school. Pic- back in those days, Sunday school was a huge thing. In fact, our church back then, um, when it was moved to a different, different uh, uh, location, the church built a bu- uh, building, and, and <clears throat> more people would come to Sunday school than go home. Today, it's just the opposite. The Sunday school was a big deal. And one year, shortly after we were there, there was a Sunday school rally. The pastor was a real promoter. They had a Sunday school bus, and they'd take, somebody would drive that bus, go to a little town of Nunica nearby, and uh, collect kids. And the Sunday school rally, I don't remember how many people they were hoping for, but they didn't tell us. They had a register up here in the wall. But they didn't tell us um, how many people came that day until church started. It was 163. And most of them were probably kids. I'll bet more than, maybe more than 100 were kids. But that was quite a time. As I look back on that, that was, uh, uh, that was church growth in those days. And then it was shortly after that, 1955, we were meeting in a building a few miles from there up on a major highway. And uh, the church men had built a, uh, a sanctuary a little bit bigger than this one. It was seat 180 if you cramp everybody in. And that church averaged for one year 210 in Sunday school. And I don't know if they, what they averaged in church, but Sunday school was 210 that one year. Um, the first pastor was there for 16 years, the founding pastor. Then there were a couple that lasted five, uh, five years. Then there was one for about 10. And the pastor that's there now has been there for over 30 years. Now that doesn't quite end up being 75, so I've missed somebody in between. But I'm looking forward to going back and just celebrating with them. That church, when they built a new building back in 68 or 69, uh, they would see 300 people. But as far as I know, it's never been filled. There were some years when they would reach 230 and 250. But now, that big auditorium, I think, if they get 200 people on a Sunday morning, that's surprising. They might get 100 or so or even less in Sunday school. And I just say that to encourage all of you, we're not very large, but large numbers doesn't really mean anything. Yes, I know it's important if church attendance starts to wane, what's wrong? Well, we should find out. I talked to a friend yesterday who, I I got invited to a pig roast yesterday. Boy, did I have a good time eating at 4.30. Um, And the church that he, he used to attend for 10 years their new pastor is doing some things that some people just didn't appreciate. I don't remember all the details, but many left. And the church board should take, should really take stock in that and take a look at that. And it may not be a, a, a legitimate kind of movie or people leaving. Maybe some things he was, maybe the pastor was doing some things that he shouldn't have been doing. I don't know. But in my home church, there were ups and downs, always. That's still kind of the way it is. Only one pastor was asked to leave. And he was only there a few months. And that's because his, he had wrong conduct towards some young women, at least one girl I remember. They got rid of him fast. And there was a man there for a, as an interim for a whole year. But the, Bob, 
the pastor there now, he, he broke all the records. He, he, he's the senior minister in, in my whole hometown. He's been there longer than in the pastor in, in that town more than anyone. And the church isn't right in town. The church is about five miles out of town. They ordained me back in 1980-some and uh, sent me to the ministry. And, and they've done marvelous things for me. I have two homemade quilts that they did, some other things, some blankets that um, one of their women's group does. I've gotten a lot of gifts from that church. But they, they've struggled too. What's been fun for me is to see people I taught a, a class, and I didn't. I, I taught a class of tenth grade boys one year. Some of them, one, at least one of them, now is a board member there. That's what we like to see when we see Jeffrey and his kids, and and Luke and his, and and Chad and his. I think of those kids growing up here, and and. Ian's probably going to be a preacher. <laughs> we don't know, but um, what's important is, the point I want to make is, God's, the kingdom of God continues to march on. Remember what Jesus said about the church? I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And of course, today, the kingdom of God is God's reign over all, all the salvation of all his, of his people. And so that would correspond to the church. Today. Someday, Jesus is going to reign on this earth as a, in the millennium, and there will be, he will have a reign over, a physical reign over lots of people. But if you're a Christian today, if you've been born again, you are a member of the kingdom of God. You've entered God's kingdom. And I trust that's true with all of you. And through us, who know him, the kingdom continues to march on. We've studied some parables. And Jesus told one about the sower. The sower was one who sowed the word. And that was our responsibility. That is our responsibility. To sow the word. And then he preached one, or he told one right after that, about the lamp. The lamp is a light. That also speaks of human responsibility. We are to be lights. Well, Jesus even said, you are the light of the world. We should take that into consideration. We should take that with a great humble spirit. Because we're going to see in, in, uh, in John chapter 8, when our class gets there, that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But in Matthew 5, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You who belong to Christ are the light of the world. And that's a, that's a marvelous thought that we probably ought to dwell on more often. How much of a light am I to, to around me? I think of that with all these kids. When they get under my skin, I've got to pick up after them. I'm teaching them in the process of that. I don't do it always. I, in fact, one of them came the other day and said, Rex, where would you like me to put this? I thought, hey, maybe we're making some progress. I've got a spot over by my garage where they can dump their stuff, and I'll take it later. So we are to be lights in the world. And so that's also our responsibility. Now last week, we, we learned about the parable of the, of the secret seed. And that the person who sows the seed, humanly speaking, throws it on the ground, puts it in the ground, but then it's, his, his responsibility is over. The seed starts to germinate. And God is in the process of causing seed to germinate uh, in the natural world. And also, he's the one that saves souls. He germinates the seed in the heart of a, of a believer, and they become believers. That's, that's God's work. In other words, that's God's, that's God's sovereignty. So he spoke about responsibility of man and then God's sovereignty. Today, I'd like to suggest to you that those two combine. When the responsibility of man and the sovereignty of God cooperate, what do we get? The growth of the kingdom of God. 
because we share the word and we live the life when people come to Christ we may not even know it but we we don't just live the life we, we, we speak the life as well we don't want to do just lip service to Christianity but we want to uh, I mean living our life being a good example but also to with our lips that we, we give people the truth the word and say well I don't know very much well you just give them what you know Talk about the, what one or two verses that you know. Or more. So let me read this to you. In verse 30 of Mark chapter 4, Jesus said, and he said, and actually he was, and he was saying, this is really the same in the Greek Testament as verse 26. How shall we picture the kingdom of God or by what parable shall we present it? Now it was... Jesus was asking this, these questions. Didn't he know? Yes, he did. Those kinds of questions were used by the rabbis to get people's attention. And who was a better rabbi, who was a better teacher than Jesus? He knew how to get people's attention and to keep people's attention. And he asked this, those questions. And so I just said simply for our... our uh, 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 a, uh, an outline that th this parable started with a twofold um, question that was a strong attention getter. That's how it started. And that was, that's not shabby because Jesus asked those questions. He was not at a loss for words. It was a device to sharpen the attention of his audience. And let's remember too, the Lord's going to reign on this earth sometime as a king. He didn't come the first time as king, although we, talk, we sing about that. He was king of the Jews, but he came to die, he came to save. He didn't come as judge. Second time he comes, he comes as judge and he will rule this earth. But the kingdom of God must be an amazingly marvelous subject for him. Because he is the kingdom of God. And those who heard him speak, many were hard-hearted. And they, they stayed hard-hearted. Hard they, they, they may have even become more hardened. Um, in verse 12, verse 12 and 13 of the same chapter, he was saying to them, To you it has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. In other words, he, didn't, he did not explain the parables always to them on the outside, in order that while seeing, they may see and not perceive, and while hearing, they may hear and not understand, lest they return and be forgiven. It was a kind of a judgment on them. Hardened hearts, and many of them stayed hardened, but some of them may have, heart, may have softened later. The Lord may have come after them later. We don't know all that. But he used this. Uh, how, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we present it? That was his, his way of, of uh, getting their attention. And revealing himself to others and saying them to them and saving them well I thought I had some more thoughts there but I don't what did I go at a great attention getter and just another reminder of what a great teacher Jesus was I'm going to, look, I'm going to refer to that again a little bit later but secondly using the symbol of a mustard seed the parable begins with description of its smallness the smallness of the kingdom and its beginning the parable of the mustard seed begins with an attention getter, but it proceeds with the smallness of the mustard seed. The kingdom of God in its beginning was very small. 120 people? All of a sudden it grew to thousands? And I think it was William Hendrickson that, that said, in 40 years, the missionary journeys had taken the gospel to all around the Mediterranean Sea. In 40 years. 
maybe not a lot of people in some of those places that were converted to Christ, but the gospel went. The kingdom of God was expanding. And Jesus uses the, the figure of planting again, like he did with a sower earlier and with the secret seed growing on its own because it speaks of God's sovereignty. He uses again the figure of planting and compares the kingdom of God to a mustard and its growth into a full-grown plant. Back home on the farm, I can remember as a kid, people walking through a cornfield that was maybe waist high um, and pulling out mustard. It was, it was some weed. It wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, something that we ate. It wasn't, wasn't food. It wasn't, the, it wasn't like the, the garden plants were eating. The mustard seed in that day was one of the garden plants. That'll be significant in a minute. It was a herb, and for a long time has been used much in the world. And in these times, has great commercial value in the manufacture of film. I read this. This is fascinating. It's amazing, but a few years ago, some years ago, I don't know how long, discovery was made about cows and their feed. If their feed was supplemented with mustard seed, they developed bones that had a superior quality for use in making silver compounds used in photographic film. Interesting. Jesus' reference here to mustard seed being the smallest seed and for that fantastic illustration, I thought, I thought it was fantastic. There are critics of what Jesus said here because it wasn't the smallest seed. Hmm. Was Jesus making a mistake? If he was, that means he wasn't God. Or did he on purpose distort the truth? No way. The truth is this. He was not comparing the mustard seed to all other seeds in existence. He was only comparing the mustard seed to other seeds of garden plants in the land of Palestine. And it was the smallest. Some seeds, in fact, many in fact, are smaller. The wild orchid is smaller. But it didn't, wasn't growing then, back there. Mustard was among many plants grown in that day in gardens and in fields of Palestine. All of those, the mustard plant has the smallest seeds, as Jesus said. The word for seed is a Greek word, sperma. In the New Testament, it's used of plants. Not weeds, but of plants. Agricultural plants. Those purposely grown for food. Of these of those of those plants in, in the uh, Palestine, the mustard seed was the smallest. There's no need ever to doubt the accuracy of Jesus' words. The critics will always be rebuked by somebody somewhere. That's why it's important to do the background, the background of uh, <clears throat> of. Um, what Jesus says here, what background of the, that world, of that, the gardens and the plants. And I want to take some time to read to you Dr. L. W. Shinners, director of the herbarium at, I, get, I, get, I take it that means he was a, a herbal kind of a man, at, at, at MSU in Dallas. He also lectured at Smithsonian Institution, and he said this, the mustard seed would indeed have been the smallest of those to have been noticed by the people at the time of Christ. The principal field crops of barley, wheat, lentils, and beans have much larger seeds, as do other plants which might have been present as weeds and so forth. There are various weeds and wildflowers belonging to the mustard, uh, amaranth, and pigweed, or chickweed, families with seeds that are so small are small and and they're smaller than mustard, but they would not have been known or or noticed by the inhabitants. They are wild. They are certainly 
and they certainly would not have been planted as a crop. The only crop in existence was smaller seeds than, than mustard is tobacco. And, his, and this plant of American origin was not grown in the old world until the 16th century or later. We don't have to doubt what Jesus said. Critics of the parable also said the size of a mustard seed, mustard plant was exaggerated. Because as a tree, there are birds of the air coming nest in its branches. The mustard that I saw growing on a farm, that was a weed, maybe a sparrow could stand up in it. I mean, it would hold up a sparrow. But these mustard seeds, mustard plants, in Palestine could grow to be 12 to 15 feet. And at certain times of year, like in the fall, they would develop branches, birds could come and, and uh, rest from their weariness and be protected from a storm, and they could build nests there. So once again, the critics have been silenced by, by the truth of, of what goes on in that country. The omniscient Jesus, and he was all-knowing, although he limited that in certain, certain times, certain ways, spoke literally and accurately in this parable. He knew just the right plant and what parable. When he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? The greatest teacher in the world. Is, or what, by what parable shall we present it? He presented it with an excellent illustration. A mustard seed. The kingdom of God. Start small. And it's always expanding. Always growing. In Jesus' earthly ministry, the kingdom was almost imperceptible. That, it was, that means not easily to perceive it was so small. Because there were few in the kingdom. Disciples and some friends and well, the 120, that was pretty small. But who knows how many, 40 years later, in all the countries that the, um, the apostles had touched, missionary journeys. On a different occasion in Luke 17, it was interesting, Brett, that you had something to say that I was going to say. On a different occasion, it did not come from within to be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Sometimes there's crowds today, there's big crowds that, that uh, are in the kingdom, but I sometimes have my skepticism about large, huge churches, especially when a pastor says he doesn't speak on sin and probably the largest church in America. Well, Jesus had a lowly beginning, placed in a manger as a babe, the cows and sheep and the goats and donkeys and other animals nearby. He was born in Bethlehem, in Galilee he grew up, in Nazareth. And Andrew says in John one forty six, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And none of the twelve apostles that took the word to the world were known, very far known, they, were, they weren't even re Jewish religious leaders, nor were they from very high economically or, or socially um, places. Few in number, they lacked education, lacked courage, they were slow to believe. Basically, they were unqualified for leadership in an earthly kingdom. But God used them mightily. And I, I just want to encourage you, he can use you as well. I have not personally led very many people to Christ. And I may have shared this sometime ago. And I got drafted with two guys named Dan. And one of them, I think, was a believer. The other one was not. And we were at, down in Detroit the night before we were to be inducted and taken to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And Dan and I were there looking out over the city and, and I gave him the gospel. And he didn't respond, but 
I just left it at that. Years later, we were out of the Army, and it might have been 10, might have been more. And I was at my home church, Ottawa Center Chapel, going to the front door, and Dan, who, who was raised nearby, was driving by in his, uh, what is that pickup? Was that an El Camino with the Chevy head? Anyway, he drove by, and he was all bearded, and I didn't recognize him. He got out came up to me. I said, Dan. And we had a good, good visit. And he kept, it sounded like he was trying to tell me something. And he couldn't really just state uh, right out. He, I said, Dan, have you become a Christian? He said, yeah. It was a girl that prompted him, his, his wife at that time. So that was encouraging to me because, and it should be encouraging to all of you, to all of us, that we give the gospel when we can. You don't know when that person's heart is going to change. I told you about my friend in Kentucky who's not responded. I pray for him that he will. And other people too. God's kingdom started like a mustard seed and it continues to grow. It will advance. It will, it will expand. There's no doubt about that. It's an excellent illustration that Jesus used by our Lord as our Lord, the master teacher that Jesus was, the kingdom of God would be, would be small at the beginning, but continue to expand, would bring great increase through the years. Well, there's a few more thoughts. Uh, the last verse, verse uh, 32. I call that the parable ends with a blessing to the world. When it was sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can, uh, can nest in, under its shade. And we talked about the size. But that last line, the birds of the air can nest under its shade, in my Bible, it's all capital letters. That means it comes from the Old Testament. Jesus, the master of using parables, also used as an, old, as an illustration some Old Testament scenes. And I want, to, I want to take it to one, and that's Nebuchadnezzar. Go to Daniel chapter 4. In fact, if you have a good reference Bible, you should have in the column over here, Ezekiel 17 and, and uh, Daniel 4. And I was just thrilled again to, to, to realize that our Lord, the master teacher, not only used parables, but he used Old Testament scenes as illustrations for a New Testament truth. Go back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. And this is that famous one about Nebuchadnezzar. We can't go into all the detail here, but he has a dream. And God humbles him greatly in this, in this uh, parable. I want you to see Daniel Four and in verses 10 through 12. Now these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth. Its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong. Its height reached to the sky. It was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. And all living creatures fed themselves from it. Folks, Nebuchadnezzar was a, a great king whose advancement of agriculture and, and arts and many other things. Um, his, his monarchy, yes, a lot of people, a lot of slavery, a lot of people died, but he, as a monarch, he ruled the world, and his some things affected the world in a, in a good way. Prosperity, and of course, he the Lord was the Lord was told, was showing him through Daniel what um, what had taken place, or what was how great he was, and that he would be greatly humbled. But notice also verse twenty. Drop down to verse twenty. The tree you saw 
Daniel speaking now, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king. You have become great and become strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar's um, leadership was unmatched his, his Babylonian Empire. He was a true monarch. In, in lots of fields of, of advancement, not just education, but architecture, agriculture, the arts, literature, and, and economics. In his vision, the birds and animals who benefited from the shade of the tree and its fruit were the other nations of the world. We don't have time for another one, but uh, Ezekiel 31, where God, through uh, the, uh, the prophet Ezekiel, is preaching a message to, to Egypt. And he uses as an illustration there... Uh, uh, Assyria, Assyria, who is effective, had, had affected the world much like the Babylonians did. And but that's in Ezekiel chapter 31. I won't, have, won't take you there, but I'm going to read to you a quote. And this, I better just stick to this quote. And this is by, by a Pastor John MacArthur. When Christians live in obedience to the Lord... A, they are a blessing to those around them. Individual believers become the source of benediction to nations. And with all their faults, those nations of the world who have been so influenced and who have recognized God's sovereignty and have sought to build their laws and standards of living on his word have proved a blessing to the rest of the world in economic, legal, cultural, and social ways, as well as spiritual and moral it's from the teachings of Scripture through Christian witness that high standards of education, justice, the dignity of women, the rights of children, prison reform, and countless other social benefits have come. That's what happened as the, the, the apostles um, preached to, to the then known world. A lot of things changed. I mentioned to you last time that uh, Benjamin Franklin loved to support and promote um, George Whitfield because when when his preaching came to a small town, sometimes there were revivals there. A lot of people's lives changed, and the communities changed. Much more honest, much more hardworking, much more moral. That's what the kingdom of God does around the world. Whenever the gospel of the kingdom of God is faithfully preached and practiced, all the world benefits. Getting back to that quote by Pastor MacArthur. And then he says this also, what the church is to the world is a macrocosm of what a believing spouse is to an unbelieving husband or wife. Just as the unbelieving partner is sanctified through the one who, does, who believes, that's 1 Corinthians 7, 14, the unbelieving world is to a decree sanctified by the presence of the true church. Jesus' point is that in spite of opposition, his kingdom starts small, and spread in power and influence to become a victorious kingdom. Before a closing thought, go back to um, Matthew, because I want to just make a couple comments about those two verses that immediately follow the parable of the mustard seed. He says this in Mark 4.33, Mark writes, and with many such parables he was speaking the word to them and they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable. In other words, that was, would be the, the crowd, the old crowd. Um, and he did not, but every, I'm sorry, I'll back up. He did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything but was explaining everything privately to his disciples. 
he would explain the meaning of the parables to his disciples. That's all that that refers to. And I like what William Hendrickson said. It's no surprise that Mark the Evangelist does not use as many parables as Luke and Matthew. There are very few. The only other message he will preach is a message on the second coming in uh, Mark chapter 13. They, the Romans wanted to see a, a man of action, a victor, and Mark presented that to them. And the parable of the mustard seed would help promote that. Blessed is the one who takes part in promoting the growth of the kingdom. And that's our responsibility. Along with trusting the sovereignty of God. If you witness to somebody, if you're a, a shining light by your lifestyle and by the words that you speak, you, you, you sow the word, and people don't want to listen, they don't, they don't hear it, that's God's business. You leave that up to him. Maybe you've testified, you could testify too, that people have come to Christ much, much later. Something impacted them. So we pray that the word that's been sown would take root. And that's God's business. That's the Holy Spirit's business. Great results have developed from small beginnings. So implied in all of this is the important lesson. Blessed is the one who takes an active part in promoting the growth of the kingdom. And with that... Turn in your Bibles, uh, no, your songbooks, to number 313. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, give all of these men and women and young people a great understanding of your kingdom and that how to enter your kingdom is through the new birth. And I pray, Lord, that as a member of your kingdom, we would be sowing the word and, and living out the light of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. And Father, as we do sow the word, may we remember that the harvesting is up to you. The growing of that seed is up to you. And we know that you will harvest souls we would desire that everyone we ever witnessed to would, be, would come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. We, we trust you, Lord, to do that in your own time and in your way. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon every believer, both now and forever. Amen.